wherever you are and however you are listening. Thank you so much for being back with us on another episode of Winning the Moment. Today, we've got a a really, really awesome episode with Mason Sawyer. He's going to get vulnerable, share some uh, unbelievable trauma that he went through, but also share how he came through on the other side of it. You can find him at the 1090 Rule I know you're going to love this episode. Be sure to like and subscribe. And most importantly, enjoy the episode. Right where you were at. So you got an interesting (laughs) story. Uh, I was just talking to Mason about a a friend of ours, Mitch Fry, who also played basketball at Snow College. Ten. I call him ten. (laughs) Ten. <laughs> he calls me two, three. I call him one, zero, or ten. It was twenty three your number because yeah. of Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted thirteen, but they didn't have it, so I had to go with MJ. And it was like a baggy jersey, and then back. back <laughs> oh, because it was by was, sizes. Yeah, and then yeah. this was like two thousand ten. So like it, the baggy shorts were still very much in. Isn't it hard to believe we played basketball in those huge shorts? Yeah. So looking at the, my snow college basketball picks, it's just it's a joke. I look like Allen Iverson. <laughs> I remember wearing going to basketball practice one day uh, on my traveling team, and my shorts were like just a, about a little bit above my knee, so like still long for today, but at that time short. And they're making fun of me, yeah, because like, oh, dude, you, th- your shorts don't even cover your knees. I, do, yeah, I remember when players <laughs> started first wearing the short shorts again. And, yeah, yeah, like, what are you doing? Like, what a weirdo. Yeah, here we are. Well, I uh, we had a Utah Tech game, and this one dude on the other team, his underwear, like his. Was showing. Yeah. Or sh- was longer than his shorts. Yeah. It's a style, man. Yeah, it's, cr- it's crazy. But back at Snow College, it wasn't. It no, was baggy. baggy shorts. That was a Fab Five. We can thank them for that. Yeah, but me and Mitch, we played a, played a, I played a year at Snow. So. And that was your whole collegiate career for basketball, or did you no, go somewhere and else? Then, uh, and then I served an LDS mission for two years, and then I came home and played basketball at uh, Utah Tech. Oh, you did? For three years. Oh, yeah. wow. That's cool. Uh what time was that? Did you didn't play Tom Whitehead? Did you? I think I was just right after. Right him, after him. Okay. I was 2013, 2016. Okay. Yeah. So I was a starting point guard, 2015 and six. What two years? What were they at that time? We were uh, Division Two. Division Two. And we were like, uh, like good Division Two. Like we had one of the best arenas, and we were, we were good. Yeah, they're having a hard time. Division One's tough because. Yeah. You're on probation for four years, which is stupid. It's so stupid. Like, so it's who like who wants to play for you? Yeah, you're crippling them for yeah, four uh, years, and you make the tournament. You can't even go. It's, like, it's so dumb. And they don't get any of the revenue share, so it's really hard to make. And then now with NIL, like everyone just leaves. You yeah, know? and then the yeah the there's transfer transfer portal. portal like, yeah, there's no loyalty. So what happened? <laughs> it's to like the sport I loved. <laughs> it uh, going back this year to Utah Tech. There's only two guys on the team from last year. Two. Yeah, it's just imagine the, that. It's the new norm, like. Yeah, it's just how it is, unfortunately. Yeah, Nick Saban went and talked to Congress about it, like it's saying, so, like it's so bad. It's so bad, and I think they should get paid, like pay him, but just or not pay him. Like I don't know. Everyone just loves money. Everyone wants money, <laughs> money, money, money. That's just what everyone cares well, about. Well, it's like they're gonna pay him one way or the other. Yeah, you know what I mean. So like, it's like, listen, I I was a college basketball player, and it was for a Division two school, and we didn't have a lot of money, and it was it was. Great times, man. Being a poor college student. That's what it's about. That was That's yeah. the experience. Right. So, I don't know. Like, if you put a college athlete on the front of a video game, like, yeah, he should get money. But, like, where we're at right now, I don't know. I think it's Yeah, or if you're selling stupid. thousands of his jerseys. or Yeah, like, I get that. But it's pretty much another professional sport at this point. Well, and that's why I think if you're going to pay him, you should have some stipulations. Like, okay, if you're getting paid, then you're here for four years. You know, just don't pay him anything, <laughs> and let's go back to, like, the crooked times when people were like, like, the blue chips. Mm-hmm. Like, you ever seen the movie Blue Chips? Of course I've seen Blue I Chips. Get a little nasty. Yeah. Like, Coach K, we yeah. all know. Like, they all did it. Oh, of course they like, did Give it. me a break. But that was, I mean, I, when I was a little kid, this is probably not the direction we wanted to be on this podcast. Hey, whatever direction we go is where but we go. I remember waking up Saturday mornings to Big East Basketball. Watching Syracuse, oh yeah, overtime Georgetown, right. yeah. I'm like man, we gave that up. So yeah, I don't watch money. much college basketball anymore because I don't know any of the players. Yeah, I don't watch it till March. 
Yeah, you know? right. Because before there was the storylines of like you knew these guys and you watched them for a few years, like Shane Battier, you're watching them grow yeah. up at Duke, and then you've got well, that rival with North Carolina, yeah. and you know those players too, and so you're like in it, you know. Now yeah. I, I don't even know who the players are. The only way I get to know is if like a Cooper Flag, who who is this high school phenom, is now going to Duke, and I know him because because of what they have on social now. You remember, you know? remember the Fab Five when yeah. they started all freshmen? Yeah. Like 30 years from now, there's going to be a Netflix, like the Fab Five, five seniors. Yeah. <laughs> they made it to the senior <laughs> year. it's going to be like yeah. DePaul. It's going to be like Wisconsin. Go to the final like, four. <laughs> yeah. And it's that's what it's going to turn into. Like, yeah. Wow, they made it to their senior. Like, it's just. Yeah, there was, uh, yeah. it was football. So Bo Nix, they were talking about, I'm a Bronco fan and our quarterback situation is abysmal. And they were talking about who they wanted. And. Uh, Sam Howell was on the Redskins. He just got traded to the Seahawks. But they're like, why don't we just get him? He's younger than Bo Nix. No way. Yes. Isn't Bo Nix, didn't he just play at Auburn? Or where was he? Well, or, he, Where did he end up? He finished at Oregon. Oregon He's been yeah. in college for like eight years. So it's like yeah. Sam Howell's been in the NFL for like three seasons. He's younger than him. Yeah, I. Uh, I it sucks, man. I used to love college basketball, but... Do you still go to the Utah Tech games? Yeah, of course. I'll go to those games. Yeah, they're they, fun. My kids just love them. Some tickets sometimes, and I'll go. It's a good. T- I wish we sold more tickets, man. Like, I don't know why no one goes. No one goes. It and listen, it's college basketball. It's not college football. Like we're not going to take four hours out of your day. Just yeah. give us an hour. And it really is such a fun environment, and the the arena it can be loud, even with like yeah, it's a good forty percent of capacity. It's loud when they played SUU last year, and it was damn near sold out. And uh, Breck, my friend, who we shared jazz tickets with, so we'd been to a bunch of jazz games that year, and he said that SU Dixie or Utah Tech game was his favorite sporting event of the year. Yeah. Because it's, it's loud fun. and it's emotional and, like, people are into it. it. I just wish the community would get behind him and, like, show up. Yeah. I, uh, like, we had decent attendance when I played, but when we played, like, Cal Baptist or BYU-Hawaii, like, it was, yeah. it was packed, man. And it was it was fun. Well, my, my son, he's seven. And we took him to the game. The last game I went to, he goes, Dad, why do they, why do they sell tickets? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, look, you can just sit anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, no, but uh, that's what it looks like. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's, I mean, it's a fair point. And then I thought about it with Lance. I was like, what if we just did give tickets away just to get people behind it? Right. Like no one's buying them anyway. So what if we just filled the arena a couple of times, let people see that it's awesome. And then start to, and now that we this is our last year of probation, so now hopefully we can keep players. We'll have some more money. Um, maybe we can get some continuity, and you can watch a kid play for three or four years, and like yeah. actually be a fan of that individual. You know. Yeah. Um. So okay, when we started, I could have sworn you said you went on a mission for two weeks. Yeah. So I went. So dude, So I wanted to play college basketball. That was my dream. And where'd you grow up? West Jordan, Utah. Okay. Salt Lake, basically. Yeah. And, like, for a 5'9 white kid from Utah, like, probably not going to happen. But, like, yeah, dude, my junior year. It's a tall order. My junior year finishes up, and I get a full-ride scholarship offer from Boise State. Wow. And so I sign it, and, like, dream come true. And then I finish my senior year. We have a good senior year. We win state. Were you always nine. good then? Yeah, I was. I mean, I was a good high school basketball. Well, you had to been to get a, yeah. to be 5'9 and get a full-ride yeah, I mean, scholarship. Yeah, I mean, first-team ju- all-state, region wow. three most outstanding player. Wow. But I was probably the third best guy on my team. Like we were loaded, but we won state anyway. We had a, I had a good high school career, and then I served a mission for about two weeks. Got sent home for um, pre- like stuff I did before I left. <laughs> oh, like they found out after the fact yeah, you weren't yeah. worthy. Well, I was, we're practicing t- teaching the law of chastity. Yeah, I'm like oh. Like I can't teach this for two years. Like I can't just fake this. Like oh sure, I need to. I need to talk to someone. Yeah. So they sent my ass home. <laughs> like you're done. And I'm where like, were you? I'm like, where's I? Th- thought there was like forgiveness and yeah. You where's were, the Jesus guy? You with repented the, with like. So I'm just so confused. I'm like, whoa. Like okay. So I get sent home and Boise State. In the meet as that's going on, Boise State's head coach gets fired. Oh shit! So I lose my scholarship. So like in two weeks, boom, send him for a mission. Oh man, lose my scholarship. It probably felt like you. My your whole ho- life was over. Yeah, for a nineteen year old. Yeah, I'm like, what the hell just happened to my life? Like, so I ended up going to snow for a year, and then my plan is to go D one. I want to go D one. Yeah, so I'm gonna go JUCO for a year and then go D one. Yeah. 
So I go to snow for a year, have a good year, really good year. Mitch said snow. you guys were good. Yeah, like I had a really good year at snow. I, I was eighth in the nation in three point percentage. Wow. Like I was, I had a good year. And got some interest from some D1 schools, Utah State. That was like my dream school in wow. high school. I wanted to go there because I usually went to the March Madness tournament. Oh, sure. Yeah. And so I wanted to go to Utah State. They were like, anyway, the, being sound from an LDS mission, like, I just, I had to go back out and do it to get all the haters off my back. Oh. Cause, yeah, because how many years ago was this? I mean, the, yeah, this was 2010. Yeah, I mean, because things have changed a lot in 14 years. But... Oh, yeah, I was getting comments from family like, oh, like, if he can't do a mission, he can't be a good father. He can't. It was, yeah. just, it was just ridiculous. So I'm like, well, I'm going to have to shut these people up and go back out. So I go back out on a mission again, and I do the full two years, and I come home, and uh, I end up going to Dixie State. Me and Courtney get married. She got into the nursing program at Dixie State. So that's, okay. that's why we wanted to come to... St. George. So where do you go on your mission at? Roll Tide, Alabama, baby. Oh, you did? You're down in the South? How was uh, that? I loved it, dude. <laughs> I love the people. Uh, I mean, when I see missionaries now, I'm like, oh, thank God I'm not on a mission. But, like, I loved it, dude. It was awesome. The food was good. The people were good. Were you in Alabama the first time, or did you get... Yeah. Oh, you yeah. were. So you just went back to where you're supposed yeah, to go. Yeah, the whole time, yeah. I saw some missionaries riding their bikes down diagonal yesterday, and I thought, like, damn, those poor bastards. Like, <laughs> Doing a mission in St. George, Utah has got to yeah, be like, boring. And what really, if they're what if they're from like Cedar? That'd be the worst. Oh, yeah, you know, because you got to experience a different culture, different people, different foods. Like if you're gonna yeah. go away for two years, go somewhere interesting. Yeah, I was. Kind of, I'm like, I don't want to learn a language. I'm like, this is gonna be bad enough. Like, I don't want to learn a language on top of it. So I, <laughs> I didn't have to learn a language, and and then I also wanted to go stateside. Like, I want McDonald's and Walmart. Yeah, you wanted those comforts. Like, I don't want these dirt floors that these missionaries are like. <laughs> yeah. But my perspective now, like, keep the perspective, give me a McDonald's. Like, I don't want, <laughs> not into that. So I, I was thrilled to go to Alabama. Uh, um, did, were you able to, like, practice basketball and, like, stay fit when you were on your mission? Or did not you really. have to, like... I mean, we, we did a lot of biking, but, I mean, unless my companion loved basketball, I didn't I didn't play a whole lot. Really? So you yeah. didn't touch a ball much for two I mean, years? I mean, I'm Pete, I would try to... Yeah. I'd try to touch a basketball, but I didn't really for two years. Was it hard to get back into it when you got back to Southern yeah. Utah? Yeah, it was. I bet. Because game shape's different. So out of shape. Yeah. Are you are you still a basketball fan today? Yeah, big basketball. I mean, I play every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at Nets on Fire. You do? In the like in the morning at like yeah. 5? 5.30 a.m.? Yeah. Those guys get I get that invite occasionally, and I'm like, Psh. they're like the polar bears of basketball. Yeah. yeah. It's like, man, I can't be there at 5.30. My body won't even like let me do it. Yeah, it's... We, I mean, we played this morning. You did? Yeah. It was good, though. <sighs> playing basketball is so fun. We had a good, we had a really, really good group playing like three times a week before COVID. And then once the churches like wouldn't let us play anymore, oh, yeah. it, like it's like that momentum thing, you know, yeah. we just lost it. Yeah. I can't like hop on a treadmill. I, I need like to dribble a ball and shoot it. Well, and, the, and, and like it's it. interval training because you're sprinting, you're right. stopping, you know, like. It's yeah. I, it's the best kind of exercise there is because I can go play it for two and well, a half, come three play, hours. Man, come hoop then. Shoot, man, five thirty in the morning. <laughs> I can get That's up that early. It's just hard to get thing. the body moving, dude. Yeah, Mitch is like five thirty a.m. And we've played like six o'clock in the morning a couple of times, but then like your first three games are just shit because everyone's yeah. body's just like warming up. Yeah, getting limber and whatnot. Um, okay, so that's great to understand your backstory a little bit. Uh, and now you've got your podcast. How many episodes are you in on your podcast? I think we're season two, episode 30, so we're probably like in the 80s. Wow. Like mid-80s. That's amazing. I had uh, Mallory give me some statistics on my episode last week. I think she said, Mal, you can jump in if I'm wrong, but I think only 20% of podcasters make it past three episodes. Mm -hmm. And then if you make it past like 22 episodes, you're in the 1% of like longest running podcasts yeah, that heard, exist. I've yeah, read the same yeah. info, yeah. It's crazy. It's a it's a grind, you know, because you got to keep showing up. And, and the it's like weekly episodes is tough. That's what I do. That's a lot tougher than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah. And the mistake I made is I didn't have any in the bank when I started. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No. See, I, I recorded was... like seven before I put my first one out just to give yourself yeah. that like... You're smarter than I I just... Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of, I wanted to do that, and I just procrastinated it until the day of. I'm like, well, I got to post something. And so <laughs> we rolled with it. But that, if I could go back, it would have been nice to have 10 in the bank. Yeah, just to give yourself that. Because it's hard, man. That grace. It is. Yeah. Well, because you got to find someone 
to show up, who's willing to have the conversation, and then you got to do it. And you I mean, to- willing to have a conversation. Like, not a lot of people want to. I mean, and I don't know what. I mean, my podcast might be a little different, but sure. we're talking about. Yeah, you're talking deep stuff. I mean, a lot of people, they say no. Like, I love what you do, but I can't. I can't be on your show. So it's hard. I mean, we get a lot of no's. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been fun. It's pretty much replaced therapy for me. I mean, it's what I count. Well, therapy. it is therapy, right? Yeah. You're talking through it. And, um, so let's let the audience know kind of, cause we're talking about what it is that you're doing now, but not the backstory, the catalyst to that. So do you want to kind of get into that? What, yeah. what created this shift for you? Yeah. So I, I mean, I grew up with a dad that taught me, I mean, I remember a conversation I had with my dad when I was a little kid. Or I was talking about like Bill Gates or like the richest guy in the yeah. world or something. Yeah. My son wants to know that all the time. Yeah. He asks me constantly, who, who, Dad, who's the richest now? I think I was at that age. Yeah. Like, he's like, is it Elon Musk? And it's like, <laughs> I was like, I think so, dude. I, I don't know, you know? So I think it was one of those conversations. Yeah. And my dad looks at me and he he's a he's a therapist, like a social worker with oh, okay. teenagers with Got it. drug addiction or whatever. Doesn't yeah. make a lot of money. Yeah. But he looks at me and he's like, Mace, I'm the richest man in the world. I have you, I have your brothers, sisters, I have your mom, you have the best mom. And he just kind of like taught me what it truly meant to be yeah. wealthy, wealthy and rich in this world. What a great answer. Yeah. So like, much better than me Googling it for my son and just telling him. Yeah. And like, <laughs> and I, I truly, my, I truly believe like if you want to be rich in this life, I think you need two things. And I think you need to love yourself when you're completely alone. Like oh, if, for sure. If you like yourself in your own head when you're completely alone, like that's pretty cool, man. And then the second thing is relationships with the people you love most, your wife, spouse, parents, kids. I mean, whoever. Yeah, whoever it is for you. Are, but well, if you have those two things, man, I think you're a very wealthy person. What I love that you said is love yourself first because I had Brad Harker on last week and we were talking about – I was saying that too many people don't ever find like an love and appreciation of themselves first. They're like, who, how can I be the best version for this other person? Right. And they, and they're getting their happiness, their admiration, their success, all validated outside of themselves, not internally. And Brad said, there's two rules in the Bible or, or I don't know, I'm not a religious person. I don't know what they call them, but it says love thy neighbor and love thy God. And he was like, I think the first one should be love thyself, you know, yeah. and then those two following. Yeah. I, yeah. That's, Basically, what, what I'm trying to say, I think, yeah. Did you feel that way before the incident, or is oh, that yeah. like, oh, you yeah, did? Okay. So that's kind of, I mean, that's what I was getting at. I mean, I could talk about my wife and kids for so long, but that was my, like, that's what I wanted in life was yeah, my wife and kids, and that's what I had with Courtney. I met Courtney when I was in high school. We were high school sweethearts, voted most likely to marry each other. After oh, wow. School. So it was like already yeah, like signed everyone, and sealed. Yeah, everyone knew. So she waited for you on your mission she then. She did, yeah. She's the reason you had to come back the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she owed me. She owed me, <laughs> she owed me a mission. No, I was joking. But no, she actually wrote me three letters a week for wow. two years. Drove my companions crazy. Like another one? Like they're not getting mail. Yeah. Like you got another one? Yeah. Three letters a week. Three That's commitment. Week. Yeah. And... um so I, lo- I mean, I loved her more than anything, and so we had kids. We had three kids together: Riggins, uh, five, almost six. We got his name off Friday Night Lights TV show. Oh, that's awesome! My daughter Olivia yeah. is named off uh, Olivia Pope on uh, on there, Scandal. There you go. <laughs> and then we had Blue, another boy, Julian Blue, and then we had a daughter, Frankie. And I, I just. I felt like I was my dad. I felt like I yeah. was the richest. Like I had everything I wanted. I had it all. And then I, I was actually the head coach at my old high school at the time. I was coaching basketball at West Jordan High School. Got a phone call from Nets on Fire here in St. George. They wanted me to come be their basketball operations guy. And it was basically my dream job. Like yeah. Train basketball players all day. Put AAU teams together. Travel and coach. I'm like, what the heck? Like, yeah. So... Courtney and I would take this job. We moved back to St. George, which is where we got married. And played, yeah. I played college. Like, we were right. in St. George. Um, and then a couple months after that, we're having a family vacation. We have a family reunion vacation every summer with my extended family. And I just took this job at Nets on Fire. And our first tournament was the same weekend as our family reunion. So I told my family, like, hey, like, can't make it this year. I just took this job. It's our first tournament. Yeah. Like, I can't skip this one, but have fun. And they're like, yeah, love you. See you next time. And my wife, Courtney, that Friday decides like, hey, 
you're just going to be coaching all weekend. It's 110 degrees outside. I'm going to take the kids to the family reunion. It'll be fun. I'm like, yeah, sounds great. You should call my brother Race because he lives in St. George. The family reunion is four hours away. It's like maybe you guys can carpool together or yeah. follow each other or something. So she calls my brother Race and they kind of have a similar issue with their mm-hmm. family. So my brother Race can go and his youngest son Ryder can go. But his wife, Keisha, son, Ran, and daughter, Faith, can't go. So Friday, my family picks up Race and Ryder, and they go to the family reunion. That Sunday coming back, uh, so it was July 25th, 2021. They're coming back from that family reunion, and big dust storm kicks up in Fillmore, Utah. It engulfs the highway. It causes a 22-car pileup. It kills eight people total. And five of those eight people were, it was our car, it was my family. So I, my wife Courtney died, my son Riggins died, my daughter Frankie died, my brother Race died, and my nephew Ryder died. My son Blue survived. He was a lone survivor. They life lighted him 45 minutes to Salt Lake. I had to drive four hours. I had to drive through the car accident to get there. I didn't drive. My my buddy Jake drove me. Um, and Blue, man, I don't know. I mean, the car accident was so bad. I couldn't, they wouldn't let me see Courtney. They're like, well, oh my God. we'll let you see her hand if you want. Um, the only person I saw was my daughter, Frankie. But the, I mean, this, it was a brutal accident, but somehow Blue survived this thing. And looking at the pictures of the accident, just not really sure how he did it, but Blue survived, and if it wasn't for him, it probably lights out. For I think I would have killed myself. I because that remember, was the only family member that you had. Left. Yeah, yeah, and um, wow, it's almost like he survived, so you could survive. I think so. I I remember telling my buddy Jake <clears throat> as because I wasn't sure the condition of Blue on the drive there. Oh well, yeah, and so I was actually as you're telling that story, I was one. I didn't know if he survived or not, so I was thinking yeah. like, man, does he? make it so i remember telling my buddy jake like I, i'm like hey if blue's not okay if he's not alive like i'm gonna kill i'm gonna kill myself and he's like no no i'm like yeah um but i got in the hospital room and blue uh he had fractured hand how old was he at the time he was almost four he was okay. four days away from turning four so he's three but wow so i couldn't even imagine the fear he's because he's old enough to have fear yeah, I mean, he went, yeah, and... And who, like, saved him? Was it... Yeah, just I mean, first responders. First responders. People at the scene. Um, I I should do a better job thanking the first responders, but... Yeah, and it's hard, it's hard to know how much Blue remembers, if anything at yeah. all. Like, sometimes he'll say things that, like, oh, does he remember? And then he'll say other things that are just... Like, he tells some people, I pulled him out of the car... Oh, okay. I was two hours away. Like, I was never in the car. So, like, it's just hard to tell with him. Maybe he felt like your energy was there to save him, you know? Oh, yeah. I never thought of that before. But, yeah, and I, what I've been told from therapists, and my dad, who's been a therapist for a while, is if he brings it up, try to talk to him about it. And, yeah, I wonder what's the right yeah, what's the right way to handle ask, that. Ask follow-up questions, but if he changes the subject or anything, then just leave him alone with it. Yeah. And don't try to force it out of him. Yeah. But uh, Blue's doing so good, man. He's that's great. He's my little hero, and and so now he's six. Then is that yeah, right? Yeah, he's six. six, almost seven. Six, he'll be seven this summer. And yeah, we uh, got him a little dirt bike, and he's been playing some basketball and one wheeling, and it's been good, man. That his one wheel that you're riding the other night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got two one wheels and. He's gotten good on it. So. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I don't know how people do that. Should, Dogs do it. Should, yeah, I've seen that little bulldog. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. It's just practice, man. So what did that recovery look like for you? Obviously, you had the focus of your son, but what about like your... Because yeah. even like knowing today you're coming on, and I remember hearing the story, like this this tragic story, and not knowing you, uh, and it's just so devastating, you know, because it's like... I can relate. Like I was just telling my barber today, like I had Sonny Hutton on a couple weeks ago who went through breast cancer. That's obviously very traumatic, but I can't relate to that. I've not had that experience, but your story, you know, I have kids and a wife and I met my wife when we were in high school. And so it's like to think 
to put myself in your shoes. It's like that. I just don't, I don't know how you do it. You know? And it's like a part of me was scared to even bring up the conversation. Cause it's like, man, that is a heavy, difficult conversation to have. Yeah. I think, uh, <clears throat> those difficult conversations, like talking and talking about these difficult conversations, I think is one thing that has helped me process the grief and try to navigate through this thing. I mean, I, I'm still uh, very much going through it day to day. Uh, I think I'm I, the shock. I mean, the first year is just basically shock. You're just like, what? And now, and how did you even find out? Like, how did you know? I just got a phone call. So I was in I was in my room waiting for them, and I, I mean, actually, my my brother's wife Keisha called me first. I was like, Mace, have you heard from them? From Racer Keisha or from Racer Courtney? And I'm like, no. I mean, Courtney just texted me when they left Fillmore. They got gas, and they should be home any minute. And she's like, race one answer, go straight to his voicemail. Like, I have a bad feeling. I'm like, no, I think it's fine. So I hang up with Keisha, and I call Courtney straight to her voicemail. I call race straight to his voicemail. Oh. And then probably, th I'm not kidding, probably 30 seconds after that, I get a call. Unknown number. I answer it. I am Dr. So-and-so from Fillmore, Utah. There's been a car accident. So I immediately put my phone on speaker before he even, I mean, he's just still just talking. I don't really know anything. And I text Keisha, like, there's been a car accident. Come pick me up. We need to get to Fillmore. Because I'm thinking that's why Race and Courtney can't get to their phone. Yeah, there's an accident, but it's okay. Yeah, they're in the hospital bed. Kids are in the hallway freaking out probably, like, we got to get over there. And then, you know, little did I know that was not the case. But so that's kind of, that's how I found out I got to. I got a phone call and some parts of that moment and day are very vivid and clear and very PTSD like, and then other moments are just, I can't even remember them. And I just can't remember spots of it at all. And people tell me some things I said or did that I just don't even, Wow. Um, I'm my nephew or my niece faith. Uh, she said, hey, I have a voicemail from you that night and you're just screaming, bloody murder, murder, crying. And I don't even remember calling her, so Ugh. I don't know how many of those are out there. Man, yeah. that is just <clears throat> un un unbearable pain. Yeah, and yeah, it is, and I. It's weird to. I think I'm still in a little bit of shock after the first year, but it's more reality set in for me a little bit more. And this is what your life is now. Yeah, like that. Like, yeah, like what are we gonna do, dude? Like this legit happened and. Yeah. Well, I think it's amazing what you've done with it. In fact, I wrote down one of your, because the 90-10 rule is 10% what happens to you, 90% what you're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. And I just, like watching some of your content in preparation for this thing, it's like it's inspiring how you've taken this tragic, terrible thing and turned it into an opportunity to to show people that you, you we have the ability to overcome difficult things. Yeah, I think, I mean, thank you. I think, uh, I mean, social media is weird. You can make yourself look something that you're not. And so I do think I fool people. I mean, people tell me all the time, like, how'd you get through it? I, I'm like, dude, like, I'm not doing very good. I'm still yeah, struggling day to day. Sure. But, and like, the first year, I, the way I was acting and handling it was not inspiring at all like it was not good i'm just drinking smoking i was gonna ask just, i wondered if you like used any substances yeah to... i just i mean i wanted to die to see him i just wanted to see him or, or the pain yeah. would stop or both which sounds great so I, there's a part of me that just wants to die and there's still a part of me that today like yeah like we kind of, we're not really scared of death like worst case scenario i get to see him like that's pretty cool yeah <laughs> so right. like it's that's weird but I, I didn't handle it great for a while, and one thing that I learned was, the, okay, this car accident with my family, it, it doesn't mean anything, actually. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean jack shit. It doesn't mean anything. How I respond to it, that's what it's going to mean. So if yeah. I'm laying in bed, poor me, why me, and just drinking myself to sleep or to death or and if that's what I do, that's why my wife died. That's why my kids died. That's why. I... So 
And it took me a while to learn that. But then I'm like, well, what would Courtney do? My wife, Courtney, was she was a nurse. She was just the most loving person. And so I thought, you know, what would Courtney do? What would Race do? What would my kids want me to do? And they'd want me to help people. And therapy, my therapist, Matt, helped me realize this too. But he, he kind of showed me that, Mason, this is terrible. This shouldn't happen to anyone. It's brutal. But it did happen to you. And this is an opportunity for you now. And Mason, like the amount of grief you have, you have an opportunity to help so many people. If you want, you can help them. If you want to drink yourself to death or kill yourself, I don't think anyone would blame you. But I'm just saying, like, you can make a difference here. And so I kind of like, <clears throat> with that information, I'm like, okay, well, if I handle this better, if I handle this good, then that's what the car accident means. So that's what I started doing. And I mean, it's been amazing, like the messages I've gotten and the, the response I've gotten. And now the car accident means good things. Yeah. And that's because of me. And, and I'm proud of myself for that. Yeah, that's I a, used to not do so good. That's an awesome perspective. I mean, really, when I was watching it, I was like, wow, because like, of some of your like keynote speeches and stuff like that. Yeah. And it was like just, you know, incredibly powerful. Uh, and I, I shared with you that Lance Brown, a friend of ours, you know, said that you were the best speaker he's ever seen. And that's he's seen a lot of people speak. Yeah, so I, I didn't know that when you told me that. I'm like, dang, he's seen a lot of people. A so. lot of people. Like I'm like talking big time. People thousands too. of people. Yeah. Big, so, big names. So I, mean, I wish really... he would have told me that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you're doing something right. And, and you're so once something happens, that becomes the reality. And the only thing that's real after that is what we do with the reality that we have. Yeah. You know, and, and, and thank heavens for you that Blue did survive. So you've got that additional purpose to. Yeah, I will say, I mean, my, what kept me here wasn't public speaking or podcasting. It was being, of course. A, being a father to Blue. Of course. And yeah. eventually that turned into other things. But like the the simplicity, but the the beauty and the importance of being a dad or, or having a purpose. Yeah. Like what's yeah, your, what's right. your why? Mm -hmm. It's so, I mean, it's, we hear it said all the time and it gets corny sometimes, but it's so true because happiness, man, like that comes in, that's just an emotion. No one's happy. The purpose of your life isn't happy. Well, and you can't live in happiness because yeah. it's fleeting. There's the moments of happiness, and but you can't arrive there. And that's why I think purpose trumps happiness is purpose will get you through rain or shine. Yeah. Yeah. So is it and now that you've told the story so many times through your speaking events and your podcast and does it get easier because you're retelling it or is it almost like it you just keep reliving it because you're constantly sharing that story? I did therapy for a while and then when I started my own podcast and public speaking that replaced therapy. Just yeah. it gave me the, very much the same feeling of relief. Kind of like you throw up. Very similar yeah. that feeling, but more like on an emotional grief Yeah, because like you're glad you threw up, you feel better now. Right. And so, and I can actually feel, I can tell like when I, when my anxiety's up, when my anger's up, when, when all those things are higher and higher, I've noticed, I haven't talked about it in a while. I haven't, done, oh. I haven't done a podcast in a while. Interesting. I, I haven't done a public speaking gig in a while. And I, and I can, and then, and if I go too long without public speaking, I'll just, I usually have a, I don't know what to call it, but I'll just cry and shake. Like a purge. Pur yeah. And I think that happens when I haven't talked about it. And so. Yeah. Interesting. I think for me, I might eventually get to a point where I don't need to talk about it as much, but, um, and I love helping other people. Like that's yeah. why I, like that's part of it. But like, I very much started the podcast for me. Like I just needed to talk about it. And yeah. Say something. Well, I think the most, so this is episode 47 and what I found to be the most like interesting perspective of doing a podcast is that one, it tells me how little I often speak to someone in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yeah, like, like you haven't looked at your phone. I haven't right? looked at my phone. Like, like we're looking at each and other. And we're not like interesting weather we're having. Yeah. Like, and, oh, like, and we didn't know each other until literally you walked yeah. in. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is a conversation that I may not even have with a, a good friend of mine, you know? Oh, yeah. So there's, there's that, there's the value of human connection. And then the other piece is how many people share things. Now, obviously you, part of your message is your story. So I knew you would share that, but I've had people on who were like, just t talking about themselves and then they'll they'll talk about how they've str uh, struggled with suicide like an alarming number of people and it's like wow 
in just a 60 minute conversation with a stranger, they're like opening up about this thing. And so then it made me think like, gosh, how many of my friends or people in my life are walking around with those same struggles, yeah. but I've just never sat across the table with them for 60 minutes to know it. And I, I mean, everyone I've interviewed, not everyone, but many people I've interviewed on my podcast, like before we hit record or maybe after they'll say, I've never talked about this. Yeah. Or I haven't talked about this in a long time. Right. And it's just like, what? Like, it's just blowing my mind. Like, yeah. And they're just, and it's, it's just that human connection. It. Right. Yeah. And we got microphones and cameras and lights and all of these things, but yet we're still just two humans having a conversation. So it really like showed me how valuable and important it is to connect with people in a real way. Yeah. And, I mean, one of the feelings I felt a lot after the accident was I just felt completely alone. Like, oh, just I'm so sure. Because how long were you with your wife? Like, because like, well, high school sweetheart. I mean, yeah. fifteen to thirty. Yeah. Wow. Half my life. And right. So, um, sorry, I forgot. Where was I going with that? Being alone, dude. So I feel so alone, and and this is one of the blessings the podcast has given me is I'm not alone. Yeah. Like. And I've had people on my podcast with just as bad stories as mine. And the way they've handled it, I mean, it's really helped me. And then the other thing the podcast has really helped me with, which might sound weird, is, I mean, just losing that many people and a wife and kids, it, it's just so And rare. your brother, too. Like, yeah, that's, like, another just, component. It's just so extremely rare that you can't help but think, like, why? Like, yeah. why was it us? And so meeting all these other, because they were the best people, dude. They were the best, nicest people. And so it was very confusing me. But now that I've had all these people on my podcast who are also the best, they're so nice, yeah. just the best people. And their lives and stories are just as brutal as mine in a very dark way that's been comforting. Me. Like, yeah. oh, like, I'm not crazy. This does happen. It didn't me. just happen to you. Yeah. Did, uh, did the incident bring you closer to your faith or push you further away? Um, faith, well, in terms of like the Christianity faith that I once had, that's completely gone. But really? I, I'm still a spiritual faith, faithful person for sure. But not not like in the typical re religious way? No, like, so after the accident, there, the first several months, I'm just riddled with fear of losing blue. Yeah, was like, good. Was it, was his recovery challenging? Was it like no? Oh I mean, no! We spent okay, one, I'm talking, and this is why I bring it up. Like, it doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm waking up in the middle of the night to check on him if he's breathing. Oh, like okay. I drop him off to school, and I'm just thinking of a hundred ways he could die at school, like choking, tripping, like all these. Things. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got. And you. then if my phone rings and blues at school, like don't be the school, don't be the school. Wow. Just like not yeah, doing PTSD, good. basically, and that was my life for a while, and then I, I just, you know, I'm not going to let this fear run my life. It already blew my world up. I'm not going to let it own me and yeah. how I do my day to day. So I kind of smiled back, and that, that's a quote I love from Marcus Aurelius: "When death smiles at you, all you can do is smile back." So I'm like, no, screw you. I'm going to live life to the f fullest, basically, and yeah. And so I, I just kind of promised myself that me and Blue were not going to let fear dictate our lives. And so when I go, went through that and then went back to religion, I just kind of felt and saw all the ways religion uses fear. They just use fear. Yeah. It's just... And shame. And shame. Because you were shamed, right? Right. And so, <clears throat> I had, so I'm like, oh, whoa. So that was different. And then, and I learned this from my wife, Courtney... But like being good, like being truly good, there is no reward of heaven. There is no brownie points. There's no gold yeah. star. You don't get a medal. You don't get a TV show. You're simply good because you choose to be good over selfishness or not yeah. being good. But no one actually cares. Yeah. You know, there's not a guy in the, no one's there's not a guy in the sky with a clipboard like, oh, check <laughs> Like, no. Yeah. It's actually really, really difficult to find and be good because it's hard, man. Yeah. When you learn that, when you, and and this, I, I really think like the world can go to hell in a handbasket with this thought. Like it actually doesn't matter. 
But if we can actually embrace it and think about it, I think it's so beautiful. It actually doesn't matter if you're, if you're good or not. The world's going to keep spinning. Can you still choose to be good? And that's what Courtney taught me. And so with those two things, I, it was easy for me to leave the, yeah. the, the religion behind with, I don't need a reward of heaven to do good. Yeah. And I'm not going to let fear dictate my day to day. So peace out. See you later. Does that feel good now? Oh, it feels so good. I bet. Plus, like, I, I mean, I don't want to get insensitive, but, like, I like to be a free thinker and to challenge my beliefs. Yeah, and sure. with religion, that's just, you just don't do that. Well, that's where I never, I could never gravitate towards anything. Not, yeah. like, no religion, just because I was, like, I remember when I first moved to Utah because that was a real cult, culture shock for me, right? Coming from Wyoming. Well, I, thought, I think cult, you said cult for a minute. <laughs> I think that was appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I remember I remember being a sophomore in high school and I'm with two of my friends and I'm like so tell me this Mother Teresa she going to heaven and and they're like well I mean she'd get the choice so when she ridiculous. got up there to decide if if this re- our religion is true and if she says yes then yeah but if she says no she can't and I was like so you're telling me <laughs> one of the greatest people on on planet Earth who devoted their life to a different belief gets up upstairs and has to say her whole life was wrong yeah and then she can go to heaven if she doesn't do that she's going to hell They're like yeah i was like no that's <laughs> not <for> hard <laughs> pass dude no <laughs> like if you're telling me i can be one of the greatest most giving people of all time and i'm and i'm going to hell unless i agree to the to agree with this person like that's yeah. that's not gonna work for me and so i just felt like i could never devout myself to anything that would mean that my thing was right and everyone else was wrong good people are not like yeah. gandhi sorry bro like not, yeah. not good enough. You're just not good enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> monks and Buddhists who don't speak for years to like yeah. self find self enlightenment. Like, and then like you could flip this on its head and talk about all the terrible people like on their deathbed, like oh Jesus all the way. And, like all right, you're in the head. Like whoa, whoa. yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh-huh. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, so it's just it was just never a thing for me. But I find yeah. it fascinating and it's interesting and and I understand why it exists because some people do need that like reward system yeah you know without it they would just like combust yeah so if you need it then great but if you don't i think that's even yeah that's kind of like if it works for you great it's just not for me yeah and yeah when your uh wife and family were alive did you guys go to church every sunday every sunday you did yeah so tell me this your uh 1090 rule did you come up with that yourself after this happened was that like an epiphany on a- no i mean the te- that quote's been around i mean there's stoic quotes go back 2000 years ago that basically say the same thing but then isn't that funny how quotes work uh, i thought i said something brilliant one yeah. day like, oh shit <laughs> brett came into the office and he asked me something i said you know what dude the the more i learn the only thing that i i know is i don't know anything and he was like oh shit i was like right and I was like, damn, that's good. And then I like, looked it yeah, up and right. Socrates yeah. said it like <laughs> before I, there was like track time. Yeah. I was like, God damn it. You know, yep. like you just, everything's out yeah, there. Yeah. So the quote, I mean, and then. Uh, it just resonated with you or. Lou Holtz, he said it. I mean, okay. so I don't know who came up with the actual quote, but I remember I'm, I'm in the process of going through therapy. So I get this idea to start a podcast kind of from my therapist. And so then I'm trying to think of what do I call this thing? Like, what do I name it? Yeah. And so I have a couple ideas in my head. And then my dad sends me this quote that says, hey, I heard this quote. I love it. I think it's great for you. And the quote was, life's 10% what happens to you and 90% what you're going to do about it. And it was just like, oh, man, this is perfect. perfect. So I called it the 1090 podcast. And that's basically how we structure our interviews. So I'll invite someone on and they'll always – they usually get nervous because I haven't said anything to them. It's like the night before, like, hey, like, what are we doing tomorrow? I'm like, oh, yeah. Like, I'll see you tomorrow. Like, we're not planning. Anything. Oh, yeah, I like, never. People are like, yeah. what are the questions you're going to ask? I'm like, no, no, no. Uh, we don't plan. Uh-uh. Yeah, but it's very, like, so we just have them come on. They talk about their 10%, whatever it is, and then we talk about their 90%. And, and it's all, so. most of your guests are all people who had trauma then, like a big trauma thing in their life? or Yeah, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's a lot of death, but. I mean, we've had Matt Blanchard on. He, he got paralyzed twice. Yeah, we've Matt's had, amazing. Made, I mean, so it doesn't have to be a loss of a loved one. But sure. It's usually pretty. Loss of something. Yeah. And and that's grief. It, grief doesn't yeah. have to be a loss of a person. Yeah. That's the most extreme one usually, but it could be loss of career, job, health, walking, Yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's how we got connected was from Matt. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah yep. I had him on and then he's like 
been trying to hook me up with everyone. I'm like, oh, thanks, man. Like, didn't have to <laughs> but he's just like a go-getter. Oh, he is. Well, he, that's the longest podcast I've ever done. The first one that we did together right here was like an hour and a half, and we were like halfway through the story. But I had yeah. another podcast guest coming. I was like, we got to stop. We're going to have to part coming. two it. Yeah. So then we part two, to, uh, like that was on a Friday, the following Monday, out in the garage with Blake, and we went for like another two hours. That dude is just so easy to just... Yeah. And his story, like what was amazing about Matt is I'd watched like his video of the dash cam wreck. And so then as he's telling me the story, I'm like, wait, that doesn't line up with the wreck I saw. And he was like, oh, no, yeah, I was paralyzed twice. Like, that's the that's the other wreck. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> that's not possible. You know, like, oh, yeah. how do you mentally deal with that? Because kind of like what you said, like, why me? Yeah. If I was Matt in that second one, I'd be like, you got to be shitting me. See, like, yeah, like. See what I mean by how much Matt's story just simply helps someone like me. Not like, okay, like, what are the actual chances someone gets paralyzed twice? Twice. Probably just as In good. In a car wreck both times. Probably just as good as someone losing what I lost yeah. in a sandstorm. Right. You know what I mean? So, like, yeah. honestly, it's just like hearing about these people's stories it does so much for me. So... Uh, yeah. they is that where that wreck was like is is that where the that cow farm is like is it yeah so have they done anything to like so we're currently in a lawsuit i was okay i wonder um, because like they're like in a, indirectly responsible for that yeah so i don't know my brother sage and my parents they've done such a good job with i don't really know what's going on or communicate yeah. much they do all the. they just tell me if i have to show up to something or sign something and yeah and i usually do it but yeah, for me, like I, intent for me matters. Like no one, no one sent on that day, July twenty fifth. No one was like, let's try to kill these people. Yeah, like, right. No one had this intent, but like at the same time, if we could not let this happen ever again, yeah. If there's a way to prevent it, we should prevent pre- do that. a guy from losing, like prevent another Mason sword. That'd be awesome. Yeah, like, let's not have another. And it wasn't just us; like other people died. It was. It's a terrible thing. So I, I'm not. I don't. I'm not trying to like make people feel bad. But if we could, yeah, prevent if we it. Can, yeah, like figure well, this out. it really shows just how frail life is. Because <clears throat> it's like I think about that kind of stuff. It's like, man, well, I could have been driving back from Salt Lake on that day. Or I've like, driven up and back to Salt Lake. Yeah, a bazillion like, million times. Could they have left thirty seconds sooner? Later, flat tire, speeding ticket. Oh, you like, of just, course, like, yeah. All these things that like just. If something could happen, it would have changed the whole thing. Well, even driving here today, I was parked at a light and I came a different way because I was coming from my haircut. And I could look at my rear view mirror and this truck is like flying up behind me. Yeah. And I think I'm like, oh, fuck, he's going to hit me. So I have to like scoot up. And I was thinking, man, if he had hit me, I would have been like, God damn it. Why did I go this way? I should have went that way. Yeah. You know, it's like you always think about what could have been different. Yeah. I just had um, this lady on from Kansas, Jillian Tinkell. That was their story. They were in the middle turning lane, her and her family, big truck, texting. And her, she said the last thing Randy, her husband, said, was, he looked in the rear view and he's like, oh, fuck. And then, boom, they get hit by this diesel and Jillian survived. Oh, a diesel. Or I, maybe not a diesel, but, but it, was a like a, it was a big yeah. truck. But uh, Jillian survived, and her youngest son, Crew, survived. But her um, son, Corbin, and husband, Randy, died. But, I mean, yeah, it's it's that. I mean, it's crazy. And, and she said she was saying similar things. Like yeah. She's like, we usually don't go that way. We usually, like, there's yeah. so many things that she thinks about. Like, we, it could have just never happened. Well, and even just, like, hearing the story and thinking about it now, it's like, I just want to run home and hug my kids, you know? Yeah. But then when they're being terrible, I'm like, fucking kids are driving me nuts you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but really it lets you have that appreciation because you just nothing's guaranteed and it's funny because i heard that my whole life but of course just, you don't know you, know, you never think it's gonna be you you just never think it'd be you and then it's you yeah what a great thing that you're doing something with it though because you know that you're making an impact do you want like is your speaking something that you really want to pursue and become like you know, a very, you know, sought after and professional speaker. Is that like one of your goals or what are your goals with the speaking and the podcast? What do you hope to, what do you, what do you hope comes out of it? Um, I don't, I honestly don't have a lot of goals cause I, I, dude, I bought this little podcast kit and I just was in my basement 
and I hit pub. I didn't think it'd turn into much. Yeah. <laughs> to be a hundred percent honest. With you. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it was just to help me talk and express some of my emotions. Um, but I mean, part of the 1090 message is like, it, it's not about money and followers and yeah. fame. It's just not about that. So it's, <clears throat> it's so <laughs> ironic and funny for someone like us. Cause like we have a cool message and yeah. we, we want everyone to hear it. We yeah, do like, right. and the more the merrier, but at the same time, don't, we don't want a lot of money. We don't want a lot of fame. We don't, we're kind of doing the fight club route. Like, don't talk about it, <laughs> but like kind of talk about it enough. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you got like, you need people to talk about it because it allows you to reach the most people. Right. Right. That's right. not. So, and then I, I have a lot of guilt and shame wrapped up in it because it, when I get money or fame or notoriety, it's great. You're like, oh, more people will hear about them and my message. Almost but, feels guilty for you to get paid, but, like sharing the travesty of your yeah, family's loss. I get that. Exactly. So it's been hard. So I, we, we're not on LinkedIn. We're, we, I never try to get speaking gigs. It's 100% word of mouth. People find me through Instagram, Facebook, our website. They ask and, and we come out and speak. Um, but the minute it turns into – the minute I feel it change in my heart chest of yeah. this isn't about grief and my family anymore. This is about money. This is about other things. You don't want it to be a business. The minute I feel that, I'm done. Yeah. Um, or we just try to prevent it from ever getting that way. But um, I just – I got to – job being a pool boy for new wave um here in st george what's new wave i'm glad you asked man it's the best pool company in st george <laughs> <laughs> this this section of the podcast is brought to you by new wave <laughs> responsible no but so like and so I, i'm a pool boy from nine to three when, while blues in school and if i don't get speaking gigs i'll just clean more pools but i'm ne i'm not i'm i'm not I don't know. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. I'm not in it for that type of stuff. Yeah. I guess. The reason I ask is because I told you Lance and I went to that speaker training. Yeah. Uh, and it was amazing because the people who run it, it's called Heroic Speaking, um, Amy and Michael Laporte and their theater, like they have MFAs from uh, NYU and Yale. And so they're theater people. And there's something to speaking uh, that is, that has that theatric experience. Right. And so it was incredible because I don't have any traditional training and speaking i'm just telling a story yeah. right and i remember the one i did at utah tech that we both did and they recorded it and i sent it to my speaking coach He's like how do you think you did i was like killed it amazing and he and he was like how was your stage presence i was like oh dude i was hitting everybody i you thought know? you did good and he's like this is terrible you're just walking back and forth <laughs> he's like there's no intention to your movement you got those stupid white shoes on all i can focus <laughs> is these white shoes and he was like you're you're you're, you're you pacing and then stupid white shoes and i was on. supposed to like because i had my white jordans on and then at the end i say like i pause i say your next moment starts now and in my mind i paused for like a minute like this is a you know let it pause. sink in i swear to god it was three seconds you know <laughs> and so it's like there's so it because it is a craft it is a it's a skill you know just like the sports that we play you can become yeah. better at it and so i wanted That's to go to this so training fun. because i'd like to be good at it if i'm gonna do it i want to bring people in yeah. let them really listen and it was so fascinating to watch how they could sh so they would it was very like vulnerable because they would be like okay who wants to come up on stage and do their open and so it's like, I'm thinking like, not me, but I know I got to raise my hand because it's like, otherwise, what am I doing? If the if the universe sees me sit there, like not raising my hand like that, he's not serious. There's a class of public speakers intimidated to public speak. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people didn't raise their hand, which was fascinating because yeah. I'm thinking like, you're you're literally here to do this. Like, Yeah, but you're speaking in front of peers of other people. I public. know. It's nothing but judgment going oh, on. Oh, yeah. And so, and they did a really good job of like setting that like, like no one is to correct. In fact, one girl did. And she was like, well, I thought. And he was like, no, never do you tell someone what you thought. You're not qualified. No. <laughs> and it was this like undressed her. And I was like, but he did it in such a professional way. And like, he was also right, you know? Man. And so people get up there and they do their opening. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Step to the left. One step here. Take a beat right here. 
and do this. And they would do it again and they improved 10 X in 30 seconds. It was one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. It was truly remarkable. Yeah, that is. I'm just interested. I would, I'd be very curious to know what they'd say about my public speaking. Cause I do my, uh, I have my buddy, Ryan, he usually comes and Uh films me when I talk or whatever. And he's like, dude, I got to put an X on the stage or something. Like you move too much. Like stop moving. I'm like I don't. I don't even know. Yeah. Because once you're up there, you don't know. You're no, just you're kind of doing your thing. The, the, I'm like really. The second one I ever did. So I did that one in Utah Tech was my first one. Then I did a second one in Columbus, and I blacked out. <laughs> oh shit! There goes my pen. Yeah. I I blacked out <laughs> entirely. Like I got done, and my wife's like, "Oh, you did great." And I was like, "I don't remember." Any of it, you know. But you're not. The thing is, when we pace, we're doing it because it makes us feel more comfortable. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Cause like you're a little bit naked. So you're like, well, if I move around or I can see my parts. And so, uh, there's such a power in standing. And then what they taught me about is like the sections of the stage that like, if you're talking about going back in time, you take a step back. And then wow. if you're bringing a present, you stand to the, f- to the front. And then if you were going to say like, well, in 2018, you would step this way because that would represent for the audience like going backwards. And so all of these really interesting techniques. I should and take a class. This is great stuff. It was amazing, dude. And also what's cool about it is uh, this part of the uh, podcast is brought to you by Heroic <laughs> Speaking. They It's free. So you have to do a $1,000 deposit no because they want to know you're going to show up. And basically they're betting on themselves because 60 people go per class. And so they know like, well, we're closing 40% of these people. Right. So it's a thousand dollars to go. And I thought for sure they would like hold the check over you at the end and be like, well, you know, if you do this, you know, something. But they first day you walk in, here's your check. Here's a thousand bucks back. Wow. They just want to make sure you show up. And then their course was around, it was like a six month to a year course where they like really dial in your keynote and you truly are you know, at that point a professional speaker. And that had a, a, a cost associated with it, of course. But the two days is free. And it was like the most valuable two days for speaking that I could ever imagine. It was amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So if you're interested, I'll connect you. It's yeah. a, I mean, it's totally worth it. Like if you're going to be on stage and. I don't know. Man. I, got, I got a lot of pools to clean. I don't know. <laughs> so do you not do Nets on Fire then? <laughs> no, I still help them out. But not like full time. Yeah. It's just hard to do. I mean, it's hard to train kids when they're at school. And then when they get out of school. You've got blue. I got blue. So I don't want to train when I got blue. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's just it's just easier. Yeah, but I still uh, I coach help coach some teams and stuff. Add notes. Yeah, are you still doing AAU things at all? Or yeah, so we just we did seventeen new tryouts that I helped with. Uh, my buddy Casey does most of it. I just kind of show up and he he makes it really easy on me. But I help out when I can. I'm sure that having as much time with Blue as possible is incredibly important uh, to yeah. you. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, for sure. That's like the number one worry on my list is yeah. how much time am I getting with Blue? I love so. that. Uh, and you said he's playing basketball now? Yeah, we signed him up for a little It's so funny, it's dude. It's so funny. I was a coach for my son, and he loves – I want him to love basketball because I love it, you know? And, like, he loves to watch it. He knows who all the Nuggets starting five are. I'll tell you their numbers and all that. And loves Chet Holmgren and loves the sport but didn't like playing it because I think – I don't know what it was. It was like too much pressure to play the right way because he wanted to like dribble and he's playing with kids who were just like running with it, you yeah. know? And so I told him like, dude, you don't have to dribble. Just run with it like the other yeah. kids. He's like, no, but that's a trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he didn't want to do it. So he loves football. But man, little kids basketball is like just chaotic. Yeah. I, I just like blues basketball coach. Like, thanks, man. Like I wouldn't want to do it. Like, oh, I'm surprised you don't do it. Trying to coach these little kids. No, oh man, I would ugh. get on the line. We're running like oh, that's how that's how that's how I do it. I got my because I coach my. I don't sons. think I'm cut out to coach six year olds. They uh they don't keep score or anything, so I always do because I want my kids yeah. to know wins or losses. Like we did well, and so we won. Good or, for you. you know what I mean. Yeah. So I tell them, and and when we practice, it's like if they're like you know because they're seven, so they're like oh, and I'm like hey, if I'm talking, I want your eyes on me. Yeah, or we're running. Yeah, you know because I'm trying to teach them like See, that's what that's what blues coach does. He's yeah. Like, He'll get on him. He's like, come on, Lucas, you got a rebound. He's like, seven. I'm like, what? Box out. The thing is. You got to work harder for me. I think that sports really shapes who we become. And it, and I'm sure, obviously, you can relate to that. And that's why so much of like winning the moment, it, it, it's based on the premise of sports. Because that's where I learned the value of winning and losing and the value yeah. of teamwork. And so like when I play 
if I'm playing guess who with my kids, you know, I'm dominating them. I'm not letting them win. And they hate it. And my wife's like, can you just let them get one? I was like, no, because they will win once. Like, yeah. you just got to get lucky. And when they do, they'll be like, oh, I actually beat them. That's why that feels so good. Yeah. You know, it's like they love Connect Four because they can sneak one in on me. <laughs> you know, like they can actually beat me at that. But yeah, no, I same philosophy with Blue. You just kick his ass until yeah. you can't. I mean, I still remember, I think I may even put it in the book, but I remember the first time I blocked one of my dad's shots in basketball. Mm -hmm. Like I can remember, I can still, I I think I was like nine and I can still see us on the driveway. I blocked it off the garage. Like I ran in and told my mom like, oh, you're never going to believe it, you know? (laughs) And so it's like, cause he'd never let me win. Right. You know, even when, when I was just a little kid. So it felt so good. Um, Okay. So last question I want to ask you before we wrap up, uh, how do you define success? Oh man. I think not giving up, uh, showing up, finishing what you started. Mm. What about, is that not a good answer? No, I'm just waiting. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't ever want to interrupt. You know, if you got something else coming, I didn't want to get in front of it. I think those are great. I mean, it's very stoic. It's amazing how valuable the simple things are. Because showing up is something that every single person has the capacity to do. There's not a single person who doesn't have the ability to show up. But well, yet, sometimes like, we just don't. I honestly think showing up and trying your hardest, that's success. Yeah. But what we've, I think what we've, what we've turned that into is back to seven-year-olds playing basketball. When they lose, we're like, hey, like, as long as you did your best. It, it's... We've kind of turned that into a tool we use to just not let these kids feel bad. Yeah. And really, when you're saying you have to show up, try your absolute hardest until it's over, that's harder than winning a basketball game. Yeah. That's harder than winning a football game. And really what that's saying is you can actually win the game, but not be successful. Oh, for sure. And... That's kind of what and that happens in people's professional lives all yeah, the time. Like, you may have the money or the position or the job or whatever, right? But you're not, and that's why winning it's harder to improve if you're winning all the time because it doesn't force you to look at yourself and like, oh, we're actually we're actually not doing great in these areas, but we're winning, so we're not going to focus yeah, on them it, it until we lose. It, right? And then once uh, you lose, uh, you're like, oh shit. But like playing your absolute we're just using sports as an example but playing your absolute let's say you play 28 minutes in a basketball game playing your absolute hardest for 28 minutes do you know how nearly impossible that is yeah. no it's rarely done yeah uh-huh. it's rarely done you're walking when you can standing when you can yeah so like i i think that really is what it means to be successful and then how the chips fall does your team or do you end up winning the match or the game who knows but to be truly successful, I think, okay, this is your max level of performance or your max level of effort you're able to give. Can you give us max effort for every second you're in the game? And that I think that's it. Well, yeah, I told my wife we had a lot of stuff going on this year with our business. And I was like, man, this year I'd like to really like be the do the best that I possibly can. Because I've really never done that. Actually, that's not true. There were times in the very beginning when I was like young and in my new professions, you've got the energy and spirit of like, I'm going to go attack this thing. Mm -hmm. But then you get comfortable and you're in life and it's like, well, I'm just not going to take that call because I just don't really want to. And I really wanted to go into this year and like, I'm really going to try my best. And we're only three months in and I've still, I can't do it. You know, like I know there's things that I should be doing and I just like, I just choose not to, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like. If you can find a way to find it inside yourself to do it when you don't want to, that's when you move the needle. Yeah. Because you're the other times you're doing it anyways. It's those times that you choose not to do it. And if you do, that's when you can really move yourself forward and wherever it is that you're trying to move yourself forward to. Yeah. Well so said. I think that's a great answer. Okay. Well, if people have listened to this and they want to know more, what are all the best ways for them to get in touch with you? They want their pool cleaned. If they want a <laughs> keynote event, what's the best way to reach out to you? Oh, that's so good. Um, yeah, we're like, our podcast is on all, uh, like Spotify, iTunes. Okay. Um, it is a weird name. So you have to, it's the number 10 and then you spell out 90. Yep. I so got that. And I'll put that in the show notes too. I'll put the link. 
Yeah, a math teacher already took the name 1090, so I had to like add the in front of it and like get creative. So yeah, weird. But um, and then we're on Instagram, and I think we have a TikTok or a Twitter. We have a, the other one. Okay. My You're audio, my audio guy does. A lot <laughs> he of does socials, it all. all right, I'll find it and I'll just put all the links in the show notes. Yeah, just if you really want to. They'll find me if they really care. Mason Sawyer, 1090. Good okay. <laughs> All right, Mason. Well, hey, thank you so much for being vulnerable. Uh, I was nervous about this because I I have a hard time having difficult conversations. I, I, don't... I, went, I had fun, man. Okay. It went good. Well, I'm happy When's to hear When's your it. next uh, speaking gig, by the way? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't have one on the docket right now. I thought I, I when because I spoke after you and when you because yeah. you were getting to the end and like this is my first one I'm like what the hell like well thank you you look like a natural up there. thanks man I appreciate it it's just a I I just became a professional speaker with Vistage which is like a uh, C suite executive like leadership coaching so oh, they're cool. like boards they get together twelve times a year eight of those twelve times they have to have a speaker mm. uh, for part of the day and so they're like three hour workshops and so I just officially made it into that program so I have some of those coming up. Um, but it's a it's a tough thing. Like you really got to commit to it. And right now, it's like a hobby. It's something I want to do more of. But yeah. it's like it's not my core business. So kind of kind of like you, just referral based. Um, but I want to get on stage as much as I can. Yeah, man, I love I'll have it. To, I'll have to check out your book too. Yeah, please do. Okay. Alrighty, sir. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.